My name is Greg Wilfred, and I took a trip to Long Island to find out firsthand the origins of these landmark bands and their long-lasting impact on the music world. I took the ferry from Bridgeport, Connecticut to Port Jefferson, Long Island. I was on my way to see the stomping grounds of these individuals. Ozzy Quintanilla, Mike Turek, Nick Natale, Mike Ronaldo, David Yule, Chloe Siebert, Adam Schwartz, and countless others to see how they created their amazing products. So I'm here right by the Bridgeport Ferry. I'm gonna be taking a ferry down to Long Island. Go check out the stomping grounds of Local 13 and all of its children bands. And I'm expecting to find a lot of people on the ferry who already know the massive influence of the true medieval night in all of uh, Local 13's music. But unfortunately, there wasn't much to be found. Well, unfortunately, there's not many people to ask about the Long Island music scene from 2003 to 2007. So we'll have to wait till we get on land at the Huntington Station to see who we can find. A friend of mine picked me up in Port Jefferson, and Mike Bonsamino, who knew the David Yule experience from long ago, took me to Huntington Station. The band started a lot of its songwriting and its rehearsing right here on Cupid Court in Huntington Station, New York at the Yule's residence at number five, Cupid Court. We started freshman year of high school. Well, I had an idea of starting a band and I asked Nick uh, to play guitar and I asked David to play bass. That's all I had. That's all we had. That's all we knew. Come with me. Come into the past. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Local 13 used to reverse. Come on down. These are the drums that, uh, the very same drums that they would use when they have rehearsals. And, uh... this, is, this is where it all happened. They do a lot of their songwriting here, so they um, have the computer here and do some recording. And Ozzy would march you towards on the keyboard, like two, three, four, over here. Yeah, they practice here all the time. And then I think almost every Friday night, we had pizza. And then the, everything on pilot to the minivan and go to the church and play music for all their friends, and it was just a good old time. I took a drive over to the Congregational Church of Huntington to meet Pastor Mark Bigelow and ask him about what these shows were like that David Yule and Local 13 would set up to play in the auditorium. Well, it was a time in our church where we had band fest, and uh, they were, at first we started doing it as a fundraiser for our youth group, and it would help to fund like a mission trip we did, and local bands would come, and they would play for free, we would charge the door, and the church would make money. And uh, they were real popular, and, and David uh, was the, David Yule was the organizer, and our producer, really, of those shows, and then Local 13 would play, and other groups. So we had a stage, we have a portable stage here, uh, here. and now uh, the lights are still up there occasionally. We, we haven't done a band fest in three or four years. Once we lost David and the, kind of that group, we lost our energy for it, and still like to find some way to start it up again. But uh, we used to get, at the most, um, 80, probably 60, 80 kids normally, but sometimes 100, 120 kids would all be packed in here. And, we, we like Local 13 as a band, it's like uh, the ska kind of bands, because a couple times we had somebody else produce the show, and they brought in like these hardcore rock bands, and these kids were uh, slam dancing, they called it here, and we were really afraid they were going to go through the windows, so we said, none of that. So everybody listen up, don't, the series, do, don't start fights, especially not here, or we'll kill you, it's not fights, or we'll kill you, you're not. If we're, if we're stopping, we'll all let you, and we don't want anyone fighting. Oh my goodness, guys. 
It doesn't bite this show we can't answer. Right. We could never we, we might not be able to have a show if anyone fights again. So we like the uh, we like the ska and the other guys do things like that. So uh, yeah, those were fun times. I was always here in the chaperone and you know, bouncer at the door basically and uh, it was always a great group and we had a great time with it. We had that big giant bass amp, big sound, and could, the upstairs upstairs would shake. It would shake all the way, two flights up, you know, and like, How often do they rehearse here? At least once every a week, week, every Friday night at least, and sometimes more than that. And then even if they weren't rehearsing, they'd sit around and write songs. And actually we had some trouble with our drummer, Mike Ronaldo, who kept getting in trouble, getting grounded. And he almost didn't play our first few shows until I uh, I took um, I wrote a letter to his parents and I drew a little picture that says we need Mike Ronaldo and I put it in his mailbox and after that he was he was good to go he was ready to play some shows. Like most starting bands, they began playing a lot of covers at live shows, including Santeria by Sublime. They also played an acoustic set of Cold Stone Creamery early on, featuring this cover of Hey Ya by Outkast. But once the members of the band stopped rolling down hills, playing covers, and actually started making punk rock, they were ready to put together one of the most epic compilations of music that Long Island had ever known. Most bands they record their first demos will record three to five songs at home. If they have good connections, they'll actually print copies and use maybe jewels cases or paper sleeves to sell them at shows. Most bands don't have that kind of money and will just print the CDs themselves on CDRs right on the marker and sell those at shows. Local 13 falls into the former category, but instead of using just three to five songs, their demo, A True Medieval Night, features 27 songs. So now, with the help of Nick Natale and Mike Turek, founding members of Local 13 and members of most of their side projects, we will take a look back at their landmark compilation CD, A True Medieval Night. Local 13, let's hear it for them. Big hand. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I think so. The first track on A True Medieval Night is extremely important. Um, it's a recording of us at a live show tuning. And um, if that was not there, the rest of the album would just not be in tune. Before It Had Begun was an instrumental track, originally. Um, I remember being in the recording studio with Mike Turek. I believe it was Tom Ratchford's house. And Mike, Mike took one of the greatest solos I've ever heard. And at every single show after that, we always played his solo from that recording, but we would play it together in unison. That's how good the solo was. And me and Nick played a lot in band class. 
uh, to the point where people are like, you guys got to stop playing that song. It's getting really annoying. But I think Nick eventually had the, the whole marching band playing it after we were, you know, hitting the big time in Walton in high school. And I recorded a solo that I think is my best solo ever, and a lot of people do. A lot of people are like, you, 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 you performed that solo off the top of your brain? <laughs> um, because I'm not very good at soloing. Many great records have an underlying current that goes throughout. Radiohead focusing on fear of technological advances and human dependency on technology in OK Computer, Marvin Gaye's focus on human suffering, peace and love in What's Going On, or the constant reoccurrence of psychedelic release in Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Local 13 took on a less abstract, but no less powerful motif for this record, Amazing Asian Grooves. Time for some Amazing Asian Grooves. The band started off where most bands only end up after years of conformity, recording, and performance experience. Sound experimentation. They wrote and perfected a standard ska tune entitled Astrology and Sadistic Humor. But once they got to the studio, they decided to take astrology a step further and manipulate it with speeding up and slowing down the song. Astrology and Sadistic Humor is a really, um, really important track for the CD. Um, we recorded it in a studio, it sounded terrific, but we were so forward thinking that we realized we need to speed up the tempo and slow down the tempo constantly throughout the whole thing. The original unedited version still exists in several compilations released by the band, but they chose to release the altered version on A True Medieval Night. Bass player David Yule had been practicing bass on his own, and stumbled upon the lick that would ultimately become the fifth song on this collection, Power of the Breath. This tune features the band at an early stage. Loose drumming, out-of-tune saxophones, questionable solos, and inaudible vocals. This style of lo-fi recording does not detract from the record, but it keeps the listener on its toes. This collection is not chronological. We are getting Local 13 scrambled in a blender. From these beginnings came the band that saw fit to create this masterpiece and include each and every stepping stone along the way. The power of the breathman is something I can use right now. So Fandango was a project um, that I designed specifically so that Local 13 could kind of delve more into the avant-garde realm. And uh, we were trying to head in this direction for quite some time. And both tracks that you hear in the demo exhibit the most expansive low 13 ever really got. Um, it's really, really important to understand that Fandango uh, wasn't necessarily a band, but it was more of a state of mind for Local 13. <laughs> The Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam in New York hosts a summer music program for high schoolers called CYM, or Crane Youth Music. Local 13 members Nick Detali and David Yule attended this program, and up there they met Max Howard, a piano player and guitarist who would collaborate with them and help them form the David Yule Experience featuring others. In their first songwriting endeavors, they used the same technique that Local 13 used in their original recordings using Mad Libs to create song lyrics. Through this, they came up with their first smash single, There's More Than One Way Out of Asia, featuring Max Howard on guitar and vocals. So they would have, um, you know, they just fill in the words, adjective, adverb, and then they'd kind of put it to music. And that was, the, that was how it started. It evolved into something a little more, um, you know, more interesting. They can enter, so collaborate later. It's a better song. Songs, Some more Asian grooves. Okay, we're going! One, two, one, two, three! 
reason the song's called Order 223 is because Nick went to uh, Taco Bell. Uh, his order number was 223, Order 223. Um, it got stolen. The order came out, some guy just ran out the door, from what I understand. Nick never got to eat his delicious Taco Bell. Yeah, that's why he called that song Order 223. And to this day, whenever we go to Taco Bell, we, we look out... Um, we look at our receipts to see if we got order 223. And whenever we do, we, like, we feel honored. Ozzy's Epic was penned by soft-spoken keyboardist and vocalist Ozzy Quintanilla. The band chose to include the original demo recording on MIDI keyboard by Ozzy, as well as a full band version of the song to be included later in the album. The song structure of Ozzy's Epic remains the same from the original demo recording through the full band instrumentation, including a hardcore breakdown, even included in the MIDI demo. Ozzy's Epic was a really, really crucial song. Um, it, was, it was really important. In fact, it was so important we had to revisit it on the album. And um, you hear a reprise at the end of it. The band continues its electronic influence with processed drums underneath electric guitar and saxophones with the 11th song on the record, The Skeeter Ruins. Electronics became really important with Open 13. Um, we wrote a song called The Skeeter Ruins, um, and it's about the second to last level of Perfect Dark, which is extremely difficult and really scary. Nick n never beat Perfect Dark, and he's always been a little ashamed of that and saddened by it. First, at least three shows we played, we were playing Light Ball because it was a new song. Oh, it was just called a New Song, and I didn't have any lyrics. I just made that. Oh. No one noticed, and it's kind of sad that no one notices because I mean, someone's like listening to what you're saying, <laughs> but I wasn't saying anything, so that's fine. The ending, the whole ending section, where. Everything cuts out except for everyone singing the chorus. And that was David's idea, and it, it, that, that part's pretty cool. I always liked it, and it made the song long and good.
This is Kablam. Kablam, it's a 1 a.m. thing, Monster Santeria. The song was... This is not a song, this is a collection of songs. And we're trying to teach Adam how to play... Um all these songs because Chloe had just left the band and uh, we didn't have recordings of any of these songs. Monster we never play and you, you know we, we stopped playing that. 1am thing we stopped playing. Kablam we played a lot because of the breakdown. I like the song. David doesn't like the song. Every single second that's a morning to me It took a little time to get some therapy Yeah, if only as a problem that you could say You're too late She told me I was stupid and that's okay I didn't realize that uh, the horn part for Kablam sounded like the Kablam theme song until I showed it to everyone and they were all like, seriously? That's Kablam. And then they start calling the song to play, you know, it hurt me deep inside, but it was okay. The breakdown. We got kids going crazy over that thing. People were thrashing, and some people said they came to shows just because of the complaint breakdown. Sean Lucas punched our, one of the teachers, Mr. Mr. Pippolo, in the face, and he was like, don't worry about it, it's okay. Like, I mean, it was an accident, he didn't do it maliciously, or on purpose. Yeah. But yeah, people went crazy about that song. The fact that Local 13 chose to include Fandango recordings on their record shows a clear unity in the band. There were no strong feelings against musical exploration in different styles, genres, or groups. This constant exploration and experimentation of sound within the band is what makes this collection so fascinating. Me and Ozzy were going to be in Fandango for a minute, and we rehearsed once. Uh, but the rehearsal was just a ploy to get me and Ozzy together and away from the rest of the crew who were hanging at David's house because they were throwing a surprise party for me. Uh, and Ozzy, mostly Ozzy. The Fandango is about a journey through time and space. It was not. We were not dying to live in there. Um, Who Cares was. I wrote that. It was probably one of the first songs that uh, was mostly me. Well, no, not really mostly me. <laughs> but the idea was mine, and that was one that I really liked, and it really kind of got us going again. All right, so what you hear on True Meetable Night, the acoustic version of Hookers, is something I recorded in a day after playing around with the song idea for probably a few weeks, uh, and sent it to David. He liked it a lot, and we, we worked from there. And, um, so I gave it to Nick, too, and Nick wrote this amazing, heavy horn part, and it was gorgeous. And we started opening shows with Hookers, and I remember feeling like a real band again after we started playing that song. <laughs>
took that song to a battle of the bands uh, in Hexer Park. Um, and we won with that. And we got the opportunity to record a uh, video and who cares, which we did. video we just didn't have time to plan it out and you know uh, a lot of product placement Apple um, Sam Ash I, I felt violated <laughs> but it was a lot of fun making it I you know despite everything I said it's a, it was a lot of fun making it I hated the way the song came out um, because they used fake drums, they used a fake guitar, they took Rich Siebert's uh, trumpet playing and they put like this weird filter over it and made it sound like it was played on a keyboard when he's like an amazing trumpet player. Um, I only got to do one take on the vocals and I didn't like that take. Um, and me and Ozzy have a um, American History Project due the, the next day, and we were going to do it the day that we recorded the video for Who Curs. Um, but we had to write a paper uh, that day, and so I just, my, my mom said, don't worry about it, just give me everything you have so far, the research and everything. And she wrote the paper for us for American History. Yeah. Um, we did a lot of work on that American History Project, though, so I don't feel too bad about it. And, you know, what, what were we going to do? We, we thought this was a huge opportunity and it was a lot of fun. Was it phenomenal, I, even if you will? Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. 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 Right down the road, actually. Right there. There's, if there's like an opposite of like bad. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> This song's for all the crazy ends out there. Uh, me, Ozzy, and uh, Ronaldo were at my house, and it was Chloe's birthday. So we were recording her a song for her birthday. And we recorded a song by Fly By Wire, another band that we played shows with a lot. Um, <laughs> so to, when we were getting the microphone working, we were just like... We just picked up the mic and started making screamo noises at it, and um, we thought it was really funny, and that's why it's on True Beatable Night. We were recording Canine Distemper and recording it and recording it, and um, our uh, our guitar player Chloe, delightful young lady, but she's having a little problem with. Um, intro to that uh, song so uh, we did it and did it finally got it kind of like not so great sounding and then 
sort of after everything is over. I think pretty much everybody had left, maybe except for Turek and, uh, and David. They kind of said, well, Dad, why don't you try, you know, so I, I put in my little guest uh, guitar introduction to it. And I don't really know that Chloe really, <laughs> she may not even know that it's not her. I don't know. I'm not sure how many people are aware that that's me. That's, that's my moment of glory, the local 13. There was another band in our high school called Southside Taxi. And we're like, we're going to write songs about how we hate each other. So this was our song um, against Southside Taxi. And I think one of the lyrics is that nasty finger that ate my dog's rock cornish hen. But it was going to be that nasty finger pen. Because David had, had this pen that looked like a finger and it was really gross. The, it was going to be that nasty finger pen that plays guitar better than me. He's the guitar player for Southside Taxi. Yep. Um, and the song was fun to play live because the chorus was SST's amazing, not. So we would say SST's amazing, and the crowd would say not, and we taught them that, and that was fun. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Um, on True Medieval Night, Sea Monster was uh, a demo I, I made to show people the song and how it's played. It's not really a great song, but, but whatever. I, I was pushing for it. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. I, I play everything on the, on the, the Sea Monster on True Medieval Night. Um, I'm playing guitar, I play saxophone, I play the weird keyboard part that doesn't really belong there. Uh, and then the drums are just synthesized. Um, and it's called C Monster because it's in the key of C, I believe. I hope it is. Um, and me and Nick and Ozzy were obsessed with this, well actually probably all of us were obsessed with this delicious drink called C Monster which was this, this fruity juice blend that we used to get in the village. Um, and it was delicious. And then, instead of it being sea monster, like, you know, a sea monster, like, uh, S-E-A, or just the letter C, like it is on the drink, um, we changed it to C, just to, conf you know, S-E-E, -E, to confuse everything. <laughs> first gained recognition through doing a show of all Disney movie theme songs. And it was brilliant. It was just brilliant. CYM back in 2006, the Korean Youth Music, uh, was just a basic summer camp where a bunch of young musicians were. Uh, I lived across the, the hall from Dave Yule, who uh, liked to put lots of trees and sort of clothes on those trees in his room. It was pretty fun. Uh, the performance of the David Yule experience, I believe, featured Max Howard, Dave Yule, obviously, Alex Slomka. Uh, Nick Papadopoulos <laughs> and uh, some assorted other horn players. Now, that was a Disney medley to remember. Um, let me try to remember it here. Uh, so, I think what basically it could sum it up with was when Dave started to sing, and he started to sing his love ballad from A Whole New World by Aladdin, uh, there was a lot of emotion there. A lot of girls started to stand up. I think. His real moment of fame came from that moment in David Yule experience.
last track on Get Amazing or Die Trying because you got through the album, so congratulations. You're amazing. Uh, the recording on True Mutable Night is us playing through it for the first time, and at the end you can hear me say, oh my god, we got through it, because it was a confusing song. At least for us it was. And actually, Nick was... Um, didn't have a pedal uh, to switch to distortion, so I was just sitting by his amp and switching him to distortion whenever he needed it. Uh, yeah. We recorded this at Brad's house too. It's one of our favorite songs. We closed with it a lot. Um, and it was about this girl at our high school who uh, was just kind of annoying, following us around. Well, not us, probably just Nick, following Nick around. Um, and she was weird. Yeah. This is the third ever performance by the Marines at Wall. Marines at Wall. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> Marines at Wall was our friend Creppy. Um, and Ozzy and him were playing StarCraft one day. I think it was probably that. They were they were they were talking on AIM. I think. Um, and Ozzy was sending him lyrics for fake hardcore songs. So Creppy took uh, a guitar that he borrowed from down the street. Um, the the lyrics from Ozzy put the headset on for like PlayStation 2 or something and started recording one of the funniest albums I've ever heard. It's just him doing the weirdest stuff ever. Are you ready for an underground? Take my hands, let me in the back again. Don't go leave your friends. Forget my name. Take my legs from under me. Let me in the back. I was the keyboardist in Marines That Wall, and um, that was a really, really difficult job, actually, because I was basically holding the band together. Um, if it wasn't for the keyboard in that band, everything would just fall apart. And the Marines That Wall were great. A few times the Marines That Wall filled in for bands that couldn't make it. One time Local 13 had a show that we couldn't play, so we got um, five people to, I think it was five of us. Me, Ozzy, Adam, um, Nick. <laughs> we all we all had guitars and we all had amps. We plugged in and we we just played Marines at Wall songs instead of Local 13 set. Under the influence of drugs. The the, the idea behind Asian Grooves was to make something musical and wonderful, and, uh, ethnic. And it was just, it was just a gorgeous piece by Ozzy, who was just going at it, you know, over AIM. He was, he, we were just like talking on the internet, and he's like, he's at, asleep over at David's, and I'm like, oh, I wanna, I wanna be hanging out with you guys and having a sleepover too. And Ozzy's like, shut up, check this out, hey, grabs man, the keyboard, Starts going at it with those Asian grooves. I love those songs. Da -da 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 -do -do -do. It's beautiful. Alright, this is Ozzy's epic. Wait, I see the epic. The band decided to revisit Ozzy's epic one last time on the record. Although this recording features the full band, Nick has put down the saxophone and plays lead guitar throughout. This recording follows the same form as Ozzy's lo-fi demo, including a heavy hardcore breakdown, complete with preppy screaming, Are you ready for the screamo? After the breakdown, the band kicks into an impromptu instrumental verse of Kablam, which fades out, or so it would seem. David then calls for the band to launch into a cover of Sugar by System of a Down. Wrong notes, but in reality, 
David nails the bass line, and Nick eventually figures out the guitar line by the time the chorus comes back. Before the song concludes, they hark back to the Marines that wall with one final hardcore breakdown. The recording cuts out at exactly 4 minutes and 23 seconds, and not a moment too soon, despite further requests from Dave. Awesome. Focus. Focus. You know about the song Ode to Peter, right? Yeah. You hear the history of the OGP yes. song? I've been for that. You stole my taco song, yeah. It's a great one. Yeah, that happened to David. That was like an incident that happened to David. Uh, Ode to Peter starts out um, with me praising our friend Peter Warner and how we love him and how wonderful he is. Because when we were in high school, there was this jackass of a person named, I don't even remember his name, he was just the kid in the blue jacket. Uh, he shaved his head, and he thought he was like a skin or something, and he was on the football team, and he wore a blue jacket all the time, and he was this huge asshole of a person that none of us liked, and very few people liked. One day at lunch, David was uh, having tacos, it was a taco day at, at school, and um, the kid in the blue jacket comes over to David, and it's like, like, hey, give me your taco. And then Peter Warner, who's also on the football team, and one of the coolest people I know, that we all know, looks at him and goes, give him, or no, what does he say? He looks at him and he goes, let him keep his taco. And then the kid in the blue jacket just walks away. And it was beautiful. And I loved Peter Warner for that. I think we all love Peter Warner for that. Uh, John Graver was in a band with Tom Ratchford like two years later found all the old recordings of Ode to Peter with Chloe talking about her vagina. Weird. <laughs> Him and Ratchford just mixed and edited together all that, that junk that we had and made the Ode to Peter. Um, that's on True Medieval Night. And it's pretty funny, but... It's kind of weird, and I, I don't show my parents it. Okay, we're recording. Like, yeah. Uh, me, Nick, and David were always in David's basement writing songs together. Um, we were we were the heart of Local 13, I would say. And one of the earliest times that we did that, we were in. Um, I think we were sophomores. And uh, I had my saxophone, David had his bass, and Nick had a guitar. Where'd you get that library? Um, we started writing a song where the idea was that he would be really happy and really light, and then it would get really crazy. And we're like, yeah, it should be called Bipolar because of all of this. Um, so... Learning this song, writing this song, and Nick looks over in the corner of David's basement and just stops. He goes, Whoa, where'd you get that library? Because David had a card catalog, an old card catalog from, I think it was from CW Post where his mom works. And Nick just called it a library, not thinking about it. And that's why he goes, Whoa, where'd you get that library? And then we just kept it in the song. <laughs> Elf Noy by Man's Pajamas. Uh, Man's Pajamas was way before Local 13. It was Ozzy and David playing old school punk rock in their in David's basement. Um, and the cool part about it was that um, neither of them were on the same instrument for every song. I mean, you know, there's always drums and bass, but they would switch uh, all the time. Um, and they wrote some of the funniest songs I've ever heard. Snoop Save the Queen, which was a beautiful song about... I have no idea what Snoop Save the Queen was about. Uh, and 
Elf Nog, which is on True Medieval Night. Medieval Night. Um, what else was there? There's the version of David playing um, in the jungle, the mighty jungle. And it's just him on drums playing a backbeat and going, In the jungle, the mighty jungle, lion sleeps at night. <laughs> and that's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. I Want You Feel is probably my favorite song by Man's Pajamas. Wait, okay. And it's about uh, reaching over someone like this. Grabbing some boo. Uh, <laughs> and it came from Ozzy and David uh, watching Degrassi Junior High. And there was a guy who was a gay student at Degrassi Junior High who was very serious. Um, who was having a sleepover with another boy who was straight and found out that the, the person he's having a sleepover with is gay and he's freaking out the whole time. And then the guy does something, I forget, I don't know what happens exactly. Like, I guess he reaches over, touches his leg or something, he goes, You just wanted a cheap feel! And that's where they got I Want a Cheap Feel from. It's a great song. Man's Pajamas almost played a few shows. Nick uh, was going to be the guitarist for Man's Pajamas. And they actually started, they, they actually did a show at Nick's house for Nick's birthday. It didn't go so well. And that was the last we ever heard of Man's Pajamas, show wise. And so the record concludes in noisy chaos, just as it began. The band played countless shows at Battles of the Bands, church shows, benefit concerts, bowling alleys, but eventually, just as Mike Turek lamented in the song, Who Curs? Everybody has to leave eventually, that's what they say. And later, they're moving on and growing up. Shows were a lot of fun, probably the most fun I had in high school. Um, and playing with these guys was the most fun I had in high school. And maybe in my life. Good times. The band members have continued on to form many different musical projects, including the short-lived Imperial Walkers, featuring David, Nick, and Mike Turek, as well as their friend Ron Stockwell on drums. They performed even more up-tempo punk rock tunes and some even slower reggae tunes. That project recorded one six-song demo and played a handful of shows around Long Island and in Potsdam, New York. Friends of Local 13 also convened and played some jazz and ska covers at the Yule's house yeah, on at least one occasion. Right now. To this day, the lasting impact of Local 13 can still be felt in ska, punk, and reggae shows around Long Island. Local 13 was um, experimenting with so many different kinds of things that ska bands just weren't doing on the scene at the time. Um, one time, instead of bringing my saxophone to a show, I brought a TV set, a Nintendo 64, and The Legend of Zelda or Green of Time. And I played all the horn licks for our songs on the Orcarina as Link was up with it on the screen. And um, people just didn't get it. You know, we, we were way ahead of our time. Despite the band's long-lasting impact on the music world, there are still many around Huntington Station and Long Island who are not aware of the band's massive influence. So have you ever heard of Local 13? No, I've never heard of them. What about the, uh, the man's pajamas? I've never heard of them either. So have you ever heard of Local 13? No, I have never. 
Never heard. What about um, what about the Marines that wall? Their hardcore project. You ever heard of them? Yeah. Excuse me. Do you have a minute? Uh, certainly. Yes. Yes. Um, have you ever heard of the the Scott Van Flint Station Local 13? No. Local 13 or um, or the Marines that wall their hardcore side project? Or, no. Right? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yes. No. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. So what's your favorite Local 13 song? What? Lo Local 13, the ska band from Lincoln Station. What? what about your favorite song by the Man's Pajamas, the side projects? No, so Save the Queen? No? No, sorry. No other band has attempted to put out such a long demo record since, and doubtful any band would or should. Once perfection has been attained, to attempt to duplicate it would only lead to an inferior product. True Medieval Night was the biggest scam I've ever pulled, probably the band's ever pulled. Uh, I had a show on my birthday, we, we didn't have a demo to sell, I took all the crap we had from recording sessions and uh, writing sessions, put it onto a disc in a random order, made a hodgepodge of a CD, and sold it for three bucks. Um, we made enough money to make some buttons, make some stickers, and it's one of the funniest things I've ever listened to, if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, but Local 13, it's always in my heart, and I love those guys. I had a great time, and I'm still the best of friends with everyone in that band, and probably always will be. First words? David, you need to get in the picture a little. Not so if. Yes, I'd like to. Yes, I'd like to. Okay, here we little go. A little closer, Dave. Ready, go. Yes, I'd like to visit the moon on a rocket ship high in the air. Yes, I'd like to visit the moon. I don't think I'd like to live there. I'd like to visit the jungle, hear the lions roar, go back in time and meet a dinosaur. No, you're upset playing. If I had my wish. No, that's not how it goes. Should I stop? <laughs> no, this is the best part. When David goes, that's David. not how it goes. David, get you're in the picture. You're ruining, you're making me look bad. Stay I'd like to visit, visit the jungle, jungle, hear the lions roar. Go back in time and meet a dinosaur. There's so many strange places that I'd like to be. But none of them hurt. Very good. So if I